So without further ado, we're going to move on to our next plenary, our seat at the table. I'm going to quickly introduce the next set of pa um, panelists as well as the moderator. I'm going to start with Mrs. Bola Adeshola, who will be serving as the moderator for this panel. Mrs. Bola Adeshola is the Senior Vice Chairman, Africa, Standard Chartered Bank Limited, Nigeria. She's also one of the founders of Wimby's and serves on the BOT. A round of applause for Mrs. Adeshola, please. That is true. There are two stairs. So if you're closer to the other end, please feel free to use the other way. Next, I'm going to introduce Professor Ibiyemi Ibilola Olatunji Belo. She rose from ranks of assistant lecturer to the first professor of physiology in Lagos State, and she will be sitting today on the panel, our seat at the table. A round of applause for her, please. Next, I'd like to call up Mrs. Oyeyemika Adeboye. Ms. Oyeyemika Adeboye serves as the Managing Director of Cabri International and also as the Cluster Director of Mondelez International West Africa. A round of applause for her as she joins this panel, please. Next, I'd like to call on Jill At Atkinsy. She, is the she was the Deputy High Commissioner to Nigeria and Abuja. And prior to that, she was the Deputy High Commissioner to Bangladesh. A round of applause for her, please. <laughs> Last but not least, I'd like to call Claire Perangelo, <clears throat> a Minister Counselor in the Senior Foreign Affairs. She acts as the Principal Officer of the US Consulate in Nigeria. I'd like to call up on stage. Thank you very much. I'd like to hand over now to our moderator, Mrs. Bolan. Thank you. Thank you very much. And good afternoon to everyone in the, in the hall. Um, I think the, the last session provided an excellent backdrop to this session because um, the last session spoke about uh, the Old Boys Club and um, the how, uh, you know, how, how women are, are, are challenged, more of the, um, the issues and so on. But this session will be more about sharing experience, the how to do it, how the very eminent achievers that I have on my left and right have actually done it. Um, if you look at how women are perceived, they're generally in the workplace seen as hardworking, multitasking, intuitive, um, and generally self-motivated. And those qualities are the typical qualities one would expect of a leader. But if you look at statistics, particularly by global consulting firms, you will find that there's this staggering gap in uh, the progression of women in the workplace generally. An interesting statistic is that 40% of clerical jobs, and jobs that are mainly sort of back office and, and lower down uh, the corporate ladder, are done by women. Yet, only 17% of executive positions are held by women, and these are just general global uh, statistics. Furthermore, the Fortune 500 companies, only of the Fortune 500 companies, only 5% of them have women as executives, and between 2017 and 2018, that number went down by about 25%. Yet I have very distinguished women on my left and my right who have achieved, oftentimes in spite of odds. So I would like to start off with a very distinguished academic and uh, really indeed uh, a very astute uh, achiever, Professor Olatunji Bello. You have achieved many firsts in academia um, and you've been in the Lassuth environment or worked with Lassuth from being a lecturer and so on all the way to being the um, deputy vice chancellor of Lassuth. So to provide some context, 
generally, women who succeed oftentimes are products of institutions that have gender-friendly policies, facilitate um, you know, uh, an environment that encourages uh, and enables women to achieve. In your case, you've been with the same institution for very many years. It'd be interesting for you to share with us um, your experience as to how your employer may have facilitated your success, your progression. You're married, you have children. Uh, your husband has been in, uh, in um, uh, government and public service for very many years, so that would have you know, also added its own challenges. Did you succeed in spite of the last tooth environment or because of the last tooth environment? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. I want to say good afternoon to everyone here. Um, I want to extend my appreciation to the organizing committee, especially the BOT who nominated me. Now, going back to the topic of our plenary session, our seat at the table. How did I get that seat at the table? We talked about uh, my rising through the ranks, but it's not just about rising, it's about persistence, it's about interest, it's about my uh, determination to be who I am now. At that, when I finished my um, first degree at the University of Ibadan, I was a youth copper at the University of Lagos College of Medicine, Department of Physiology, and to correct the impression, I spent about 22 years in the University of Lagos before going to um, Lagos State University. So my entire academic uh, life was in the University of Lagos, where I was retained as a youth copper. And um, they, they gave me opportunities, right? I was able to uh, come in as a graduate part-time demonstrator. That helped, that's the part-time training for me not as a woman, not as a girl, because I was just barely 21. But then, it was a general thing. I was unique in one aspect. I was de dedicated to the job, had the interest, and was more focused. People were telling us, why were you, why, what do you want to do in physiology? And I said, well, if I have to get my PhD to be somebody in physiology, then I would get that PhD. So I, you know, I got the encouragement of my mentors, male mentors, and um, they supported me. And what, at the end, I became the assistant um, associate professor of physiology in the University of Lagos. I went through different training sessions. Apart from the university supporting us as students and um, student teachers, I also tried to support myself. In what way did I support myself? There were very few grants for research, especially I'm a scientist, so you need to be in the laboratories. You need to work. There were so many, very few grants, and we competed for the grants. But then, because I was a little bit, I, I, at least I could, my parents could afford to support me, I, I could go abroad to do some things go to conferences, be part of international, uh, my international professional body, be able to pay my dues, and that helped quite a, a lot to, you know, to prop me up. 
In the academia, it's either you publish or you perish. And once you know that, you need to do more work. There was a time I was telling my colleagues at Diaraba then, my male colleagues, I said, well, you know you, after we've all gone through the laboratories and so on, you go back home, your wife will, you, you will just cross your legs, you will be reading papers. Your wife will cook for you. I'm still, I'm leaving now. I'm going home to cook, to make sure that everything is okay at home. That's the difference. So we women, before we can move up, we work three times, five times harder than the men. We need to, we need to continue to do this. And if you just rest on your ass and do what others are doing, then my dear sisters, you will not get anywhere. But then you need to work extra hard to beat your male colleague. Well, I became, I became a professor in the university, Lagos State University, and because of my active nature, I was able to um, be, be elected by the Senate as the deputy vice chancellor. When you are, as a professor, I was automatically, uh, well, I am an automatically a member of the university senate. The senate is the highest academic uh, policy making body of the university. So if you are a professor and you are a member of the senate, then you are already, you've already made it. And then when you know that you are just a few women in the senate, you are in the male dominated um, um, environment. The only way is that you, are, you assert yourself, you are, be outspoken, you are active. And when I was nominated, along with another man, a male colleague, for the position of the Deputy Vice Chancellor of the university, I beat the male colleague hands down. Well, thank, thank you very much, um, thank uh, you, Professor Bill. I just have a, a follow-up question, if you could answer that in about a minute because you said that um, you had to work you know, three times, four times um, as hard to get your seat at the table. Um, so clearly the organization did not necessarily facilitate um, you putting in as much as, the, uh, as your male colleague and you getting a seat based on merit. That is, you, you had to really do you know, a hard slog. And I, I, the, the, the question is, for the next um, lecturer or professor or female lecturer, um, what are you doing now to ensure that the organization, the, 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 you know, Lasso, the, the, the university, is um, putting in place female-friendly or inclusive-friendly policies that mean that a woman doesn't have to work 27 hours, a man works 23 hours, and she only gets her seat at the table because she's working harder, and where, where both of them have the same capabilities and the same talents. So in, in, in a minute, if you could just tell us what, okay. um, what, what's different now from your decades in the university. In, in my university, we, we are looking at uh, trying to get the 30, a 30% affirmative action for women. And we, I am, I'm always complaining, even with, uh, to my VC, that this is not right when you have all the members of management all being male. There's not one, member, one female member amongst them. I've always been saying that. But then we'll continue to talk about it. We'll continue to, you know, say so. so. But as a leader, I am a role model to many other university professors, younger professors, and um, upcoming um, scientists. We encourage them, and whenever their, their, their positions or whatever the issues come up, we do our best to make sure that they get that position. Th thank you very much. Um, I, I, I would like this to dovetail into Claire actually, um, 
because this should be a conversation and there are no sort of preset um, questions. Uh, as part of your career, you had worked on um, human resources, policies, and performance. Uh, and I'm saying this because it links directly to some of what you've said. The way to facilitate more women in the workplace is to actually be deliberate and intentional about the policies that we have. And when you were working on you know, human resources, evaluation, performance management, and so on, were there any specific um, actions that you took um, or that the, the, um, the, the, the Foreign Office, so to speak, the, the State Department uh, took to help um, make it easier for women to balance all the different issues that you know, we're contending with um, to ensure they stay longer in the workplace and to make sure that they progress? <clears throat> well, thank you. Um, I was actually very captured by some of the comments of the previous panel, and one gentleman was very uh, good at talking about inherent bias and unconscious bias. So there are many things that may hamper women's advancement. Old boys network, not having a seat at the table. Um, you know, when there are nine, or t nine out of 10 seats at the table are men and only one woman, I don't think you can ask the one woman to pull every other woman up. It has to be a shared burden. But what I looked at was how, as institutions, as companies, as corporations, as governments, do we try to create a system that is fair across the board and how we evaluate people and their talents. So unconscious bias and inherent bias is that it's a human nature. We tend to like people who are like us or have similar experiences as us, and that colors our opinions of their abilities to do things. So what you try to do is first be aware of bias, and then second, try to create a system that is transparent and fair. And by that I mean, you know, and, and I liked his, his suggestion about surveying companies. And if you were to survey companies, I would ask, what are your criteria for promoting? What are the qualities that a person has to show and be evaluated on in order for us to know that they're ready to be promoted. So it's not just, oh, he's a good guy or she's a good girl and I really like them and you know they've got a lot of potential. Well, what is it that they did? So that you have criteria that you can apply across the board. Gender doesn't matter, ethnicity doesn't matter, uh, or national origin doesn't matter because everybody gets measured by the same criteria. And then, when you're evaluating people, you can't just have one person making the decision. What we did was made sure that we had a diverse committee of people that represented women, men, different ethnicities, different races, different interests, that sat down and reviewed the evaluations of our personnel. So that everybody brought a different experience to the table. And we found that that was the way to be much more fair People were able to evaluate on the criteria and evaluate fairly. And that's how you at least start that mid-level that the former speaker was talking about. It's great to get people on the board of directors, but how do you get there? They've got to have a path up. And the path up is by creating a transparent, fair system of how do we reward our people and how do we promote our people. Um, and that's really, really tough to do. It, it, there's no doubt about it. It's very, very difficult. But that would be the question I would say to companies. How do you evaluate your people? Let me see your criteria. What's your percentage of promotions per year, men versus women? Right. What is your career path for people, man or woman? Who's making those decisions? If it's one or two people making the decisions, that's when inherent bias kicks in. We're going to like people who have the same skill sets or the background as us. You know, I'm, I'm from California in the United States, and I always have to fight against the fact that I prefer Californians, because I do. It's where I grew up. You have many different areas in this country, and I hear people describe themselves first as, you know, the state or the ethnicity, and then the third thing they'll say is, I'm Nigerian. And that has to factor in the way that you're evaluating your, your women and men. 
So th that's really it. It's creating a system that is transparent, that is fair, that is based on specific criteria that everybody can be measured against, and then having a fair way of evaluating. You cannot leave it to one or two people to make those kinds of decisions because they'll make the decisions that are like them. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, thank you. I, I think uh, you, you touched on um, unconscious bias and one of the things that oftentimes militate against um, uh, women. So I'll, I'll go to um, um, Yumika now. Um, you are a core uh, business person, um, a core finance professional. You've had you know, decades um, as, as a finance director. Um, again, even though there are a few women, you know, female accountants, um, to have risen to the top you know, in listed companies, um, I'm sure could not have been that easy. So you are at the table, you are more or less at the head of the table now as CEO of, um, of Cadbury. Um, could you share from your experience some of the challenges you may have faced, um, any unconscious bias uh, that you've experienced, um, and what it is that you're doing now to ensure that you're in your organization, women naturally stay longer and also rise. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Board of Trustees of Wimby's um, for inviting me. I'd also like to thank you for the army that came to visit me at Cadbury um, on the courtesy visit. I was expecting three people, um, and I had over 10 people. Thank you very much. I feel very honored. I felt very loved um, um, by that. Um, so I'll start with me. Uh, essentially, I've worked with two multinationals. Um, I worked for a Nigerian bottling company as C CFO, um, and I worked with four MDs. And um, I think one of the things I always said to myself, all male, all male. So um, one of the things I said to myself always was, and I I'll be very frank with you, I never thought of myself as a woman um, and that being a bias for me. I just did my job and did it very well. I always said to myself as a Christian, um, Thank you. I always said to myself as a Christian that, you know, whatever I do, I do it because I've been placed there by God, and that's who's going to assess my performance. So there was no need for eye service at any point in time. Um, when you talk about challenges, I've been very fortunate. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be blunt about that and frank. I've been very fortunate. Um, three of the four MDs I worked with were accommodating. So I started off, you know, as a young uh, CFO, and I, was, I just got married year one. So children were coming along. Work still had to be done. Um, you know, nobody cares that you have a husband and whatever at home. But I had uh, bosses who accommodated my growth as I, as I did my job. Um, I, I think Foluka is here. She bumped into me at the airport once, baby in front, backpack, wheelie bag, going for work. Now I had a CEO who said to me, what do you need as you go for this business trip? And I said, I need a nanny in the hotel when I go for my meetings because I'm breastfeeding and I must do this. I'm not going to stop this because of work. And my company made it possible. You know, so you work in an environment. So if you work in an environment where you are encouraged, you really don't have an excuse anymore not to perform. If you have all the support system around you. So I had not only I work the support system from, you know, responsible supervisors, but also support system at home with a husband and a mother um, who did school runs for me when I couldn't do school runs. Um, going into, and again, conversations, you talk about challenges. Going into uh, a role as a CF, CFO, you are the number two. So you technically know a lot about the business. 90% um, of the time, I'll hear my, my CEO say, Yimika, I need you with me. I need you to come with me. So I, I, I felt like I knew everything. And I always said to myself, if I'm following you around, why can't I do the job? Um, and that happened through my life in my first company. And when I walked into Cadbury and I had developmental conversations, I was very particular. What do you want to do? I want to be CEO because I can do it. I don't see anything these guys are doing that I can't do. And I had that, and I had that in my head all the time. Um, and you know, we talked about women pulling women. So we're talking about challenges. The first CEO came, I was number two. He left. The second one came, I was number two. And when the second one came, he kept saying, I need your help, I need you, I don't understand Nigeria. By the way, all expatriates, I don't understand Nigeria, I need you to pull me through this. Um, and I had a board of directors, uh, Mrs. Awushika Ibukun, you're here? Who kept saying to me, and this is very important, 
Yimika, we know you can do this job. We're working for you. Um, as a multinational, obviously, competition is, competition is very, very, very fierce because, you know, I'm not, when a role comes up in a multinational, you're looking across 176 countries for someone to replace. You're not looking at the locals. In fact, the local is the last person to look at. Um, that's the first thing. Second thing is Cadbury had just gone through a misstatement, as some of you may know, many years ago, where they, the company had a local CFO and a local CEO. So in terms of trusting and all that, that question mark was always there. But I had a board that said, competence is important, and we don't see you keep bringing in people when we have locals who can do the job. Um, and that was very important for me because while I did my work, I knew that you know, I had people, I, people had my back, if I could use those words. Very interesting. Um, I, I'll, I'll just ask you to pause there for a minute because two things are picked up. Um, you knew what you wanted. And so in a career conversation, you were able to say, I want to be CEO. Uh, and I'd like you to talk about that maybe a little bit later on because I think for many women, they're not sure about what they want. And even when they know what they want, oftentimes they're not bold enough or organized or articulate enough to say, this is exactly what I want. So that's an interesting point. The second thing you mentioned was about the role of uh, mentors or the role of you know, people who um, had your back and how they also helped you believe in yourself. And I want to turn to Jill um, on, 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 on that point. Um, I mean, you've been in foreign service for, for many years. You've worked in uh, many countries. And the interesting thing is um, you've also been involved in matters that traditionally are sort of male, hard male areas like uh, defense. Um, you know, issues to do with negotiating NATO uh, relations and, and, and so on. Um, and in, in order to get to the table, keep your seat at the table, um, were there any specific influences, people who kept you going and encouraged you, either as mentors, sponsors, um, but that believed in you? Could you share your experience on that? Uh, so, yes, thank you. Um, so I'll give you a short anecdote to start with. Um, I was about, I think about 12 years old, um, and I was uh, agonizing about what to start studying for my exams. And I was doing the washing up with my dad. He was a new man. He did the washing up. <laughs> and he said to me... Yellow ball this time. No yellow Not ball yellow this ball. time. <laughs> he said to me, I don't know what you're bothered about. By the time you're 30, you'll be married with three children and you won't be working. So what you study doesn't really matter. He got it a bit wrong. <laughs> um, no children, not married. Um, reasonable success in life. And I have to say, to be very fair to my dad, who I loved deeply, he was very proud. Um, so I have an interesting challenge because I probably spent the first 15 years of my career essentially with no women. Um, I have photographs of myself on training courses, at dinners, with 25 or 30 men and me. Um, life has moved on. It's much better now. Um, it's worth me saying here in Nigeria, our High Commissioner is a woman. I'm a woman, the other deputy is a woman, our director Africa in London is a woman, and our director general is a woman. So, you know, life really has changed. But perhaps one thing I can share with you is that the person who really took me from being a, a junior person working in an incredibly male environment and said, I think you have potential, was a man. So I think there is a really important role for women mentors. They can help us with some of the agonies that perhaps men don't go through. Uh, for me, some of the agonies about decisions about where I've lived in the world, the societies I'm trying to work in. Can I have a reasonable conversation with a man about whether I can be an effective diplomat in a deeply conservative, male-dominated, patriarchal society? That's hard. Can I have that conversation with a woman? Absolutely. 
But for me, it was a man who looked at me, sat me down and said, Jill, if you work hard and you take risks and take yourself out of your safe space, I think you have the potential to go further. I'm still in touch with him. He's 78 now. I still see him every Christmas. And I have to say, he is another proud man that he took a risk on me. But for women, your decisions are different. Your pressures are different. Uh, some of the issues you have to consider are different. And what a female mentor can give you is the space, the safety, the experience, perhaps, to understand how some of those pressures impact on your decision making. Now, we've been talking about a seat at the top table, but one of the points I want to pick up from the early, earlier panelists is it's about all the way through the system. It's about spotting the support or spotting the individual who is capable of more and helping them take the first step and the second step. And it's through taking those steps that the third, the fourth, the top come. So help all the way through your organizations. Very interesting and uh, well done. Um, before we um, go into q and I just wanted each panelist, um, because when we talk about seats at the table, that presupposes that there is a table, uh, it's populated by some people, um, and they decide who joins them uh, at the table. What advice would you give to uh, a, a, a young lady uh, in a situation where there's no table, or she's not invited to the table? What advice would you give her to building her own table? Projecting herself. I, I, won't, say, I won't say what my thoughts are, but how can you encourage the women in this room where they've not been invited to a table to build their own table. Prof, I'll start off with you. So just one minute each and then we'll, we'll go to Q&A. One thing is, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. So once, whenever you, what, wherever you find yourself, there may not be a table, there may not be a boardroom, but you strive to be the best. Create a table for yourself. You can, be, you can be the head of that table. How do you create a table? <laughs> okay. Have a focus. You have a focus. Raise men and women. Build, you know, like um, you be a convener of an organization, you have already created a table for yourself. Be a convener, you must be innovative. No matter what, where you find yourself, try as much as possible to create a space for yourself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thanks. Uh, Claire, how can we build our own table? Well, I, I like that analogy because what I was thinking is, like, like Gil, um, when I came into the U.S. Diplomatic Corps, I didn't have many women role models or mentors. Um, and it was still a new thing for men to kind of help pull up women. So what I have found over my career is that in building your table, what that means to me is you can't always be looking up to have a godmother or a godfather who's going to pull you up. You have to look to the person to the left and the person to the right who are also coming up and you create those networks and you can pull each other up, right? As you're going up, you pull each other up by supporting each other, by helping people know about opportunities, by speaking well of each other to others. We have something we call the corridor reputation, which is even more important than what's on paper. It's how other people talk about us, right? And what our reputation is. And that's how you build your own table with the people who are sitting right next to you in this room today. Thank you. Very insightful. Yumika. I think I... In your case, if you didn't 
If you hadn't gotten the CEO role, would you have built your own table? Actually, when I left NBC, um, I worked in NBC for 13 years, um, so I knew the business. Plus, I came from a manufacturing family background. My, my, my father was a manufacturer, so I, I lived in a factory all my life. When I left NBC, I actually wanted to set up my business. And, and my wonderful husband was really supportive. We had gotten to this place where we had gone to inspect land for factory site. But in all that time, and this is where I guess my faith comes in, at potentially six or seven calls from different headhunters um, trying to recruit me for various multinationals. So my husband said, you know, maybe God is telling you something because in one day, one particular day, the day he was meant to pay the Omoniles, you know who Omoniles are, <laughs> I had two calls and I had one particular company offering me literally say, what do you want? I thought, okay, this is, this, is, this is interesting. So yes, I would have done that. And then I would have had my own table, I guess. And, and, and that's really part of it. So it's not just about the career and, um, you know, uh, making sure we're competent, we have the capacity and so on, but stepping out and taking a risk because even if you were born in a, in a, in a factory or a warehouse, you know, it doesn't make you an implement and it doesn't necessarily mean, um, you know, you, you can run yours. But I, I think that's very commendable. And I think a lot of women should take a cue from that where there's no table, build your own. Jill. What would you tell them to do? Um, so I think for me, in some ways, I spent a large part of my career not even knowing there was a table. <laughs> it was a long way away, and I didn't really see it, and we were lucky if we got a, a senior manager visiting us once a year. So the table wasn't there. But what I did, uh, I think, was two things. The first was having absolute confidence in my ability to do the job. So I was dealing with, um, at the time, Royal Air Force pilots. And I was 22, 23 years old, sometimes briefing a room of 50 or 100 aircrew. If I could not stand up there with confidence, by God, they'd not listen. They are a very, very critical bunch of people because of the danger and risk of what they do. So I said, the first thing was confidence. And the second thing for me was, I didn't sit there as a 22-year-old expecting to become a senior diplomat. But what happened to me was every few years, I'd sit there and I'd look around and I'd think, I'm a bit bored now. And I'd look up at the next layer and go, well, I can do your job. I can do it as well as you and possibly better than you. So I'll give it a shot and I'll make that space and I'll make people respect me. And suddenly, the top table was in sight. And then I started looking at the top table and thought, well, I can do that too. So I'll give it a shot. And I'll tell you, I had to work hard, and at times I did waver in my self-belief. But then I'd sit down and I'd grip my teeth and I'd go, no, I can do this. Carry on, try again, girl, you'll get there. Excellent, yeah. so confidence, um, self-belief, and not, not outsourcing your career or your destiny to the organization and taking charge of it. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, I think we'll now go to Q&A so that we can actually address specific issues um, or questions that um, the ladies may have. So how do we, shall I okay, hand over so to you once to again, just help? Once again, please, we need to keep the questions concise so that we can get through as many as possible. If you have any questions, you can kindly come up. There are two microphones, the one I'm standing in front of and the one that Adironke is standing in front of. Adironke, once we have three people, Sorry, two people at each, then we need to cut it, and then we're taking from the online. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. also pleased that in asking the questions, we don't sort of get too granular about our individual personal situations, but rather sorry. ask for, um, you know, general guidance or advice so that we don't get too personal. Yeah. Thank you. First question. Okay. Sorry. First question. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you very much. It was absolutely um, an interesting session. My name is Jumoke Adegunle. 
Um, I've worked for Lafarge Africa for about 10 years, and currently I head, I head um, the mortar division of Lafarge Africa. I really found a lot of things you said relatable because I also work with a multinational, um, and I've had several of the points that you raised in, in my personal life. The question I want to ask is, how have you dealt with doubts? Madam, you mentioned it just a little, but I just want to go deeper. In cases where you've had self-doubt, what exactly have you done to get yourself out of it? Could you repeat the question for us, please, or just summarize it? Okay, so I think yeah, what yeah, she's cool. trying to ask is practical steps of handling self-doubt while you're on the job. So as you start to rise on the um, move ranks and you start to doubt yourself when you're trying to get ahead, how do you, practical steps on handling that? So I think it was touched on a little bit when you said, you know. Sorry, next question on the other side. Um, hello everyone, my name is Yinka Daudu. Um, my question is about self-promotion. Um, as we know, women usually have a bit of a problem in this area. Um, my question is, what tips do you have for women on how to self-promote? You have the competency, you have the capability, you're confident, but how do you self-promote in a way that is not too much and is not too little? Thank you. Sorry ma'am, should we take all four questions and answer? Okay. Sorry. Okay, good afternoon all. My name is Glory Okangawodo. I work with FITC. My question goes to Mam Claire. I wanted to emphasize the importance of professional counseling for women. When we talk about mentoring, it's awesome. When we talk about um, we talk about the support system, they vary. But I know one part that is key that can put this together is professional counseling. And in Nigeria, we don't really emphasize that. Then also to WIMBIS, I want to ask, what are you doing about creating a pool that you can support, fund them, that they can be counselors, developmental psychologists, they can talk to people and clear issues? Thank you very much. Uh, My name we, is I think we should respond to the three questions okay, and then we'll just take the, okay. the last three. I think it helps so we keep the train of thought. Um, we didn't really hear the first question very well, but I think it's about self-doubt. Good, okay. So I think Jill, Jill, would you take that? The second question Yemeka will take, and it's about the confidence to self-promote and speaks to exactly how she described um, her ascension to CEO. And um, Claire, the third one about professional counseling, could you address that, please? Thank you. Okay, so self-doubt. Um, I think one of the later panels is talking about imposter syndrome. Um, and yes, I have imposter syndrome. Um, I, I, I spoke a little earlier on about my start in life. Um, I come from a small, uh, old industrial town in the north of England. Um, and I have ended up working for an organization which in the UK has a reputation of being an organization full of uh, wealthy, upper-class men. It's not quite as bad as the reputation, but there's some reality there. And from time to time, I do sit there, and I have to say, I come in and I see an audience this size and go, oh, why do they want to listen to me? Um, but what I try and come back to is look back at what I've done, the environments I've worked in and what I've achieved and go, I couldn't have done that if I wasn't good at my job. So, you know, wherever you are on your career ladder, whether it's right at the start, you look back at what you did at university or at school, if you're further out, what did you do? What, why did you deserve to be promoted? Look at that. Think about that. And also look at your peers and compare yourselves to them. And rather than comparing yourselves to them in a negative way, go, so there was this issue or this problem or this task and I did it. I solved it. I was the one who led the project. So look at what you've succeeded at and use that to reinforce your self-belief. Thank you very much. Um, Yimika, on the confidence to self-promote. 
First of all, you're a brand. Each one of us is a brand. If you remember that you're a brand, then I believe that everything else falls in place. The reality is that the only way you can, quote and unquote, present, promote, I don't want to use the word sell, but you know, market yourself, is to create a brand that um, is the right brand. So one of the things I, for example, my brand, integrity is on top of my list. So you can't ask me to do something that I don't believe I sh in, in terms of my beliefs that I want to do. So your integrity is very important. People will know you for that and people will say, okay, People would even say, don't go to her for this because she won't do it. They won't even bother. So you need to define who you are, what are the things, what are the values and qualities you stand for, and make that more important. We're women, so appearance is also very important. Um, a lot of young women in my office uh, know me for something. I jokingly say, if I see you wearing a skirt where if you can't bend down and pick it up, it's a problem, or if you do this and I can see your it's a problem. So, you know, it's also appearance is very important. I work in a multinational. There are more men in my company than women. I think it's, uh, you know, my company has uh, been promoting, and we are promoting uh, diversity and, and um, inclusion. We have 40% diversity um, target. Uh, on our management board, uh, my other colleague for Lacan is here, who is our chief counsel. So there are two women out of, se out of seven men. So we are the ambassadors of the women in our company, and we want women to essentially uh, brand themselves in a way that when they talk about you, they wouldn't be talking about you. So, oh, is it that girl that wears the red skirt or the one that wears a short skirt? But more say to you, oh, is that the girl that, you know, deliver the numbers for the sales team? That's who we are. And that's what we need to do. Thank you very much, um, Yimika. And I think that um, at some point, and I would suggest to the Executive um, Council of, of Wimbase, that we need to have maybe practical workshops in how to um, self-promote within the organization based on your competence uh, and, and, your, and your capacity. I think, you know, practical role plays and so on so that young women are able to claim that seat at the table without being brash and doing other things uh, that they shouldn't be doing. Jill, the, question, the third question on professional counseling. Thank you. I think my answer kind of goes over all of those three areas. You know, it, it, women tend to self-doubt and have doubts about how to self-promote much more than men do. And as I was coming up in my diplomatic corps, I was told the reason there weren't more women at higher levels is that women did not put themselves forward to compete. Well, that was complete baloney. <laughs> Let's be honest. But, but there is a key there. So when you have self-doubts, how do you get out of it? You have to do a really honest and kind, be kind to yourself. Honest and kind assessment of what are my skills? What am I good at? What am I doing well? And also where do I need to do better? But those are the skills you also need to be able to articulate when you're self-promoting. It's not about the glad handing and the flashiness. You have to be able to articulate to a new employer, to your current boss, to whoever. Here's what I am, here's what I'm good at, Here's how I showed leadership. Here's how I showed management. This is what I can do. That's how you self-promote. You talk about what you can do and what your potential is for the future. But that gets also to the counseling issue. In my system, one very, very important part of our evaluation process is regular professional development. You need, whether there is someone else who can do that for you, or you yourself need to be very clear-eyed and say, okay, I've got these eight skills, but to get ahead, I really, I'm looking around and I see I need to do this other thing. I need to find somebody who can counsel me on how to acquire that skill or how to do better in that area. It's absolutely critical, but it's also really tough. And counseling and professional development should be with the idea of how to make your skills better, not a list of what you're doing wrong. That, that psychologically doesn't work. Here's what you can do better. Here's how you can do better. And I think you ask around to your colleagues. You ask the people you are working for. I want honest feedback. And then you try to work on that honest feedback to then have those skill sets that you are confident in to be able to do your self-promotion, to get ahead. Great. Thank, Thank you, so much. you so very much. Very practical. So we'll take the last uh, So two more two questions. questions. One physical question and one live stream question. 
So right after your question, okay. then we'll take the okay. live stream question. All right, good evening, everybody. My name is Nisi. My question is this. It's good to have a place on the table, but is it also possible to lose the place on the table? What can you do to sustain your place at the table? Okay. Could we kindly have the live stream question, please? We have a question from the live stream from Omolola, who is asking... What advice do you have for working mothers who don't have access to nannies like one of the panelists had? How can we make ourselves valuable and still have all the things that we can while having the babies? So the question, the question, sorry, if I got this right, the question is about people who don't have access to a support system. Right, mothers, they, working mothers. Nannies specifically. Yes, working, working mothers nannies. who don't have um, the I support system. I think this goes system. to Mrs. Yemika's example of being able to take her nanny with her on the trip. So I guess people are asking, what if you don't have the opportunity of having a nanny in the, when, and work with you when you need to take those bold steps as the example that Mrs. Yemika gave? And the last question. How do you sustain your place at the table? It's one thing to have, get a place on the table. How do you then sustain your place at the table? Prof, can you take the, um, the question on sustaining your place at the table? How do I sustain my place at the table? At the table, you are, you are there already. You, you want to sustain your place. My experience. You must have managerial skills. You must be assertive. You must have the... You must be intelligent. While you have all this, politics, bedroom politics, also matters. At the table, you need to know what the, your, 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 um, the leaders want, and you need to, you know, work towards what they want. At the same time, don't deprive yourself or the women folks of the, um, their needs. So to sustain yourself, you must play the politics. But that is the truth. You must play the politics. Ed. I wasn't able to play the politics and I paid dearly for it. I was always assertive. I will bear my mind. But then, because I did not play politics, I was not made their substantive vice chancellor. So in order to sustain yourself at that table, play the politics. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Bello. Um, I think, because, you know, there's, there seems to be a lot of reaction in the room. I said there seems to be a lot of reaction in the room uh, regarding playing politics. Because, of course, there's good politics and there's bad politics. And I think Yemika said she wants to chip in can I, can something I just, there. Can I just um, say something um, that's important about the playing politics? I think we need to choose the words we use. Um, I wouldn't call it playing politics. As a leader, it's no longer your technical competence that's important. Nobody cares that I know the debits and credits of accounting as a CFO. What they cared was, was how I related with people. So my people, my colleagues, my superiors, and how I manage those people. You can, you can, you can, you know, profs use the word politics, but that's what it is. It's managing relationships and how best you manage those relationships as a leader. That's what's important. 
So please, please don't uh, look at the. Uh, let me give you a classic example. So while I was while I was CFO, a lot of the, I was the only woman in the team in NBC. Okay, so I mean I was the only woman in the team. We would go for meetings um, outside of the country, and after the meetings, all the men want to go and have a drink. I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. So they would say to me, are you coming with us? And I'll say, no. At my appraiser, my boss said to me, Yimika, you're fantastic, you're doing everything right, but you know, you need to join the boys. <laughs> Guess what? I started going. I would drink orange juice, my clothes would smell of cigarettes, my hair would smell of cigarettes, I would get to my room, I would wash myself like I've just been in the wrong place, but it worked. It worked. You have to be practical. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying compromise. I'm saying look at the situation and handle it in a mature manner. I, I think a very important word here is wisdom. 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 Seeking advice, talking to people, and doing what best serves your purpose but does not compromise your values and your integrity. But above That's all, very important. your competence your capabilities must show through. So what Prof said about play politics is correct. It's correct. But I, what, that's why I said there's good politics, bad politics. Bad politics is eye service. Doing the wrong thing when you know that you should be doing the right thing. Doing things to please people when it's not in the best interest of the organization and is self-serving to other individuals. That's bad politics. And that will not get you anywhere. It's exactly what Ms. Ifejika said in the last panel that it won't get you anywhere. But the examples, and that's why I like the fact that in Wimbis it's experiential. The examples that have been shared show that you can actually win smartly. You can win with wisdom. So that's my own uh, uh, summary there. I think there was... Um, I, I trust we've addressed the issues. Oh, the issue of none is yes. You said you wanted so, to address that. I, I mean, for me, it's, it's simple. I don't, want, I don't want to make it belittle it, but we are fortunate as Nigerians to have a support system. Make the most of it. Sister, mommy, grandma. There, there, there's abundance. We just need to make the most of it. That's, that's all I'll say. It's not about, oh, I don't have a nanny, so how do I cope? Look around you and, and again, wisdom. Look at what works around you. In, in a couple of words, um, enhance your domestic and community infrastructure. So it's not about nanny, domestic and community infrastructure. Anybody who can help you do what you do well, use and support. So, um, you know, that, 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 uh, that helps because of the issues around uh, what women are, are contending with. Um, where are our organizers here? Can we take any more questions? Are we done? I, I think this has really been very, very um, uh, insightful. Um, the distinguished panelists here, um, Professor Bello, Jill, who is the Deputy High Commissioner to um, Nigeria from Britain, uh, Claire Peangelo. Pe Claire, thank you very much, and you're most welcome. We know you've only been in Nigeria for uh, two, three or four months, and um, our shining uh, CEO here. Actually, when it was announced that Dimi had become CEO of Cadbury, I called her, and I was crying on the phone with tears of joy. Well done. Thank you very much for always uh, role modeling those values to the younger women as well. So we've spoken, in summary, dedication and focus, positive role of the right mentors, know what you want and state it with confidence, dealing with unconscious bias and managing your brand, role modeling the values and staying in your lane. Thank you very much, ladies, for uh, listening and contributing to this panel. Um, and I'm truly honored. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another round of applause for this amazing panel. Full of wisdom, full of nuggets. Amazing if we could get back on time so that we can dive into our next panel.